Hello and welcome to Pandora Astrology's monthly horoscope for May of 2023. We are the astrologers of Pandora Astrology. I'm Jamie Kell Miller. I'm in Berkeley, California. And I'm Julia Mijas and I'm in San Francisco, California. Let's take a look at what's happening in May. Mm. Happy birthday, Gemini. If you haven't gotten your yearly birthday reading yet, it's not too late to benefit from a thorough look at your solar return birthday chart. It tells you all about the year ahead, and it comes with fantastic affirmations you can use all year to create your best life. You'll find a link for it in the description below. Now let's take a look at May for you, Gemini. Well, on May 1st, Pluto goes retrograde. It does this every year. Here you can see on April 30th, it was still direct. And now the little red RX symbol appears to let us know that Pluto has begun moving backwards. So Pluto has recently arrived in Aquarius, where he's going to begin transforming the world of tech and innovation and uh, utopia, the concept of utopia, communities, friendships, and all of those Aquarian things. He's going to be doing that for a really long time, but this year he's getting started going retrograde in Aquarius, but will quickly be moving back into Capricorn. Pluto transforms, metamorphoses. Pluto puts us through a death and rebirth ringer sometimes. So Pluto transits can be super heavy and um, they have a tendency to uncover things that uh, make us uncomfortable, make us feel vulnerable. But um, when we listen to our conscience and allow our greater self to lead us, then uh, we can come through a Pluto transit very smoothly. Pluto's going retrograde in your ninth house, which means that you might be feeling this in your philosophy of life, your belief system, your opinions. These things might need transforming, and you might feel vulnerable until you do transform them. This is really just the beginning of a process that's going to happen over years, more than a decade, and so there may be some hints as to how this is going to go this month while Pluto is going retrograde. And we'll say more about it in future horoscopes. Also on May 1st, Juno leaves the sign of Taurus, enters Gemini, which is your first house. So yay, Juno comes into your sign. Juno is so personable, social, relatable. She is all about committed partnerships of all kinds, whether personal or professional. She is a leader of people. She is a matchmaker, someone who hooks people up with each other who should know each other, and, um, and she weaves the fabric of society together. So when Juno comes into your first house, you might find yourself playing the role of the matchmaker. You might find yourself presenting as partnerable. And so if you're single, this could be a really great time for putting yourself out there for dating. If you want to meet somebody because you're presenting as partnerable, this month. So that's some pretty good stuff. And if you want to use this Juno transit to amp up your social life, and if you are partnered happily, then this would be a really good time for doing some entertaining, setting up some double dates, maybe involving like, you know, your best friend and your partner's best friend and getting them together uh, because you think maybe they should know each other. Hmm, that might lead to something good. So, um, yeah, Juno can bring all of those wonderful experiences. Now I want to talk about Ceres, which has been retrograde since early February. And here she is traveling along through your fourth house in Virgo. And uh, she went retrograde in February in Libra in your fifth house and triggered a financial rebalancing period. Series has to do with food, body, and money, the things that connect us to the physical world and ground us and make us feel supported. 
And when she went retrograde in Libra, that triggered the beginning of a time when we need to reevaluate and look into and perhaps return to some old ways of managing our diet, our budget, our health practices, um, so that we can have better longevity. And so this is a reevaluation period with a view to bringing things into a state of balance that perhaps they lack. Ceres right now is turning direct, and here you can see her do it. There she is retrograde, and boom, there uh, the little red RX symbol has gone away, so she's direct now. And in your fourth house, this is the house of home and family, domestic life, heritage, and roots. And Ceres here wants you to pay more attention to the health of your family members, children, if you're raising them, your partner, if you live with somebody, uh, or your own body, or maybe even fur babies that you live with. And um, Ceres just wants you to take the whole of your big or small clan and uh, make sure that every physical body that is in your care is eating the food that's right for it in whatever phase of life it happens to be in. So maybe how your partner needs to eat is different from how your, you know, small child needs to eat, certainly different from how your cat needs to eat, <laughs> and everybody needs to eat the right stuff for them. So this is a really good transit for sorting all that stuff out and organizing it in a really great way. Ceres is going to speed up, and as she goes faster and faster, any of the tangles and snarls that came up in the areas of food and money over the last several of months are going to get untangled, and that's going to feel pretty nice. Hey, Julia, what's up with Mercury, Venus, and Mars for the Geminis of the world, especially Mercury, because that's Gemini's ruling planet? Yes, it is. Well, there is some good news there, Gemini, because even though Mercury starts off retrograde this month and also retrograde in the 12th house, not an easy place, by mid-month, he will go direct. So it'll. Be, I think the end of the month is going to be a lot easier than the beginning of the month. So I'll start with Mercury retrograde in the 12th at the beginning. So um, the 12th house is a house of isolation. Um, it's also a house where we can sometimes sabotage ourselves a little bit. Um, and Mercury represents your mind. It's the planet of communication. So Mercury retrograde in the 12th house, one of the things you need to be aware of is to be very careful with your words. Um, not trying to scare you or anything, but just be careful not to sort of uh, deliberately deceive people. You know, errors and omission can totally count. You know, not telling mm -hmm. people the full truth. Um, you know, because that stuff can definitely come back to bite you with Mercury retrograde here. And since the 12th house is a house of healing, um, Mercury retrograde might be a time where you're really reviewing your healing, really whatever type of psychological, spiritual, um, even the 12th house can have kind of a, a physical healing element as well to it. Um, the traditional people said this was the house of, of chronic illness, interestingly enough. Um, you might have to go back over those strategies. Um, but by May 1st, with Mercury conjoined the sun, albeit retrograde, making it lesser epiphany day, um, this can be a time of insights and revelation amidst all of this confusion you've been dealing with. Um, so keep it, keep track of the early month and sort of see what insights. And since this is this 12th house, these are going to be probably rather ethereal insights, like waking up from a dream or in the middle of meditation and having your aha moment there. Uh, then by May 14th, Mercury finally goes direct in this house, which is fabulous. Um, and as Mercury goes direct in the 12th, you know, um, it's just going to be a a good time of of kind of your your mind might be more drawn to fantasy your your um, dream life might be more vivid it's kind of like your mind is more in the ethereal dimension than right here on planet earth which is fine um, unless you have a lot of things you need to do at work or at school um, now venus which represents beauty is in your first house for the first week of the month so you're looking extra beautiful because the first house is the house of self great transit if you are single um you know in springtime what is it men's fancy turns to love that this is the first week of may is definitely going to have that vibe for you if you're single <laughs> and if you're in a relationship you know just enjoy looking a little extra beautiful for your partner um and bringing a little bit more harmony into the relationship because you will definitely um be much more venusian yourself then by may 7th venus enters the second house and this is a very very sensual house 
um, it's naturally ruled by Taurus. So Venus in the second is just going to want to indulge. You know, you might be eating a lot. You might be spending your money on a massage. Uh, Venus in the second loves to go shopping as well. Um, and so this is just a, a fabulous time to really live through your five senses um, and enjoy things that way. And uh, maybe you can also get a little luck with, in terms of making money with Venus in the second, because this is a money house after all. Um, and then I do have to mention Mars. Mars starts off in your second house. So um, he's also going to be in there adding a little bit of choppiness into the second house for the first almost three weeks of the month. Um, so Mars is a planet of drive and a positive use of this transit is using your drive to gain a little bit more money in your life. You know, maybe putting some effort into researching how you can, uh, inc you know, maybe grow your business or maybe uh, think of ways where you can increase your income in some fashion. Uh, Mars in the second is great for that. But Mars in the second can be a bit impulsive with spending, especially because Venus is coming in here as well. Um, so there's there's going to be a tendency to just kind of like want to spend a little bit impulsively, especially on really indulgent things. Um, so I definitely think for this month, while you can acquire some nice things with Venus in the second, make sure everything has a return policy. <laughs> Don't buy on credit, you know, make sure everything has a good return policy and that you have a window of time to really sit and wait until you're patient um, to decide whether you actually want that thing or not. Mm -hmm. Then on May 20th, Mars goes into your third house. This house can represent your commute in a lot of ways. It's the house of short journeys. So Mars in the third house might bring some frustrations to your commute. Uh, if you do, if you, let's say every weekend, go over to a partner's house or you go to work a few times a week or whatever it is, um, you know, maybe there's some issues with your bike or with the train that you take, or maybe with your car, or maybe there's a lot of traffic. Um, you know, there could be just, you know, a little bit of crunchiness in terms of any types of short journeys you have to take. Um, but at the same time, there's a part of you that's just rearing to get out of the house, um, not, not stay put, but maybe just go out to a park. This is a fabulous transit for jogging through your neighborhood, doing an outdoor activity in your local town. If you've got a dog, just, you know, walk them for a few hours, um, you know, maybe on the weekend or after work or something. Um, and that would be a much better use of this transit. Um, Mars in the third can also bring a feisty time with your siblings, other relatives like aunts and cousins and things of that nature, if you're close to any of those. Um, so make sure that you know, there are ways you can exercise your patience um, if tempers flare up and you're around some near, uh, near close relatives of yours. Mm. Hi, Jamie here. I just wanted to say thank you for watching this video. And if you're enjoying it, please consider becoming a patron on Patreon. Your support helps keep this content free, and you can also get access to workshops where I will cast your chart live in the workshop. The link can be found in the description below. Thanks again, and let's get back to the video. Well, there are a couple of moons that I want to tell you about. Starting on May 5th with the lunar eclipse in Scorpio. It is eclipse season. It began last month in April with a solar eclipse, and now it's continuing and finishing with this lunar eclipse in Scorpio right here, which lands in your sixth house. Now, lunar eclipses show us our shadow, as all eclipses do, but lunar eclipses show us our shadow through how we feel. They really stir the pot emotionally. This particular eclipse is landing in your sixth house, in Scorpio, and uh, that's part of why we call this eclipse, you are not in control. Because Scorpio is, uh, well, moon in Scorpio, let's just put it that way, like moon in Scorpio, whether it's in your natal chart or it's transiting or it's in the form of an eclipse, moon struggles in Scorpio. And uh, often a moon in Scorpio can veer into the histrionic, the dramatic, the paranoid, uh, can just feel things so keenly that, um, that it can be all out of proportion to what is actually happening. This eclipse also has some stress built in because of the opposition to some planets over here, Vesta, Sun, and Uranus. Much more about that in the video we made about it called uh, You Are Not in Control on um, 
on our website, pandoraastrology.com, in the monthly forecast uh, tab there. Um, but suffice it to say that because this um, lunar eclipse is landing in your sixth house, and this is a house of health, work, service, and personal organization, you might be feeling especially emotionally jangled and even, you know, paranoid and vulnerable in, you know, on the job, in your workplace. You might feel like, you know, I've been uncomfortable in this workplace for a while and today I just can't take it. And your emotions might erupt. And it might even be a really good occasion for washing your emotional center clean of things that you've been avoiding feeling for a while. It could leave you with a much cleaner workplace. Um, and that's really because this moon is near the south node, making this a releasing eclipse rather than an initiating eclipse. So it's not a good eclipse for starting things with future repercussions, but more about cleaning up old repercussions. So this is also a house of health, and it's a house of creating order. And you might have feelings come up around any of these things. Um, I would especially watch out for the health of breasts and stomach, which is the moon-ruled body parts, mm. potentially also your reproductive system. So pay careful attention to the health of these areas with this eclipse landing in your sixth house. Uh, the other moon I want to tell you about is a new moon in Taurus. And let me tell you, it is so much nicer, so much smoother. <clears throat> it's happening on the 19th. And you can see it right here, sun and moon together in your 12th house at the end of Taurus. And there is so much harmony built into this moon. It has a beautiful sextile to Neptune and a trine to Pluto. It has a trine to Ceres as well and a sextile to Mars. Tons of harmony and no stress at all. And boy, do we need that after this eclipse season. It's been pretty difficult. So um, the new moon in Taurus is a wonderful time for new beginnings of things that you want to be planted very firmly in the ground and to grow in a very solid way. New moons are always good for new beginnings. And, um, and this one in particular is placed in the very fertile and very solid sign of Taurus. I have been warning people, and I said this in the video that we made about it, which again is found on the forecast page. Um, if you don't wanna conceive, then you should use your contraception during this moon. If you do want to conceive, this moon might be a really good time, especially if it lines up with your cycle. Um, but this particular moon landing in your own 12th house, Gemini, um, does suggest that if you want to access the wonderful traits and properties of this moon, that doing so from a position of... Um, retreat, re rest, recuper recuperation, you know, sort of a more spiritual uh, zone of your life is, uh, is going to yield, you know, the best possible access to this moon. We're calling this moon gradual transformation fuels intuitive action. And I love to say about, you know, when Pluto forms a trine, to a moon like this, I like to say, and you can transform, you can go through a metamorphosis, a death and rebirth experience, and it doesn't even have to hurt. And so uh, if you heard me at the top of this horoscope, when I said that maybe you're due for a transformation in your worldview, because of Pluto going direct in your ninth house, well, this moon might really help you to, you know, begin that transformation of your worldview, and it doesn't even have to hurt. So that's pretty good stuff. Um, so then the last thing that I want to speak to is the seasonal change. And you can see here, and the, in the early part of the month, there's a, just a massive pile of planets in Taurus. And this is really also just kind of a, a signature of 
the time of year that it is for you, Gemini. If you're a Gemini sun, then you're in your annual mop up period. And even if you're a Gemini rising, all these planets in your 12th house have you feeling like it's time to kind of pull back, pull within, reevaluate how the previous, you know, year cycle has gone and, uh, and ask yourself, what do you want to begin in the new year? So um, this, uh, this time of your annual MAPA period is there to help you clear away and let go of and finish and close out and complete the themes of your previous year so that you can clear the decks for your new year. And then the sun moves into Gemini on May 21st. It'll be traveling along your first house for about 30 days. And um, while the sun is in your first house, it's great to let people put attention on you. It's great to just receive the high quality attention that people in your life would like to bring you. And if you're normally a kind of a shy person who doesn't, you know, really like to draw attention to yourself, this month might be a really good time to make an exception from May 21st for 30 days onward. Um, let yourself receive the sunlight uh, and, and the nourishment that comes with that sunlight of the high quality attention of people who care about you and people who see you. And you might even ask them for, um, for some clues about how you can be a better version of yourself. Well, that's all for today. If you love Pandora Astrology's free and informative horoscopes, please do hit that like button, subscribe to our channel, and share our horoscopes with your friends. We make these horoscopes for you for free, and if you appreciate it, supporting us on Patreon is the best way to show it. Share our horoscopes with your friends, too. Enjoy your May, and until next time, we'll see you around the cosmos. Bye-bye.